a look at the Golden Gate Bridge, one of the fabled landmarks in this beautiful city, San Francisco, where it's beautiful to be a Giants fan as well. The team on top in the National League West as they come in off the road, and tonight they start a four-game series at Candlestick Park against the Chicago Cubs. I'm Al Michaels, and welcome to San Francisco, where the Giants are hopeful of winning a pennant for the first time since 1962. The Cubs, of course, would like to win their first since 1945, but Chicago, after leading the National League East for much of May and June, has really fallen upon hard times. For instance, Andre Dawson is old for his last 18. Ryan Sandberg is old for his last 22. The Cubs collectively are old for their last six, having dropped every game on the just-concluded homestand to Montreal and Pittsburgh. And the fans of the Cubs are going, uh-oh, as they see if they can turn it around tonight with a victory out west. The Cubs, though, have played well on the road. But the Giants have played extremely well at home this season. And somehow, some way, with paste and glue, I suppose, Roger Craig has kept a pitching staff with a lot of pitchers on the disabled list in working order so well in fact that the Giants come in tonight with a second best earned run average in baseball and on top in the National League West. Let's take a look at the standings now. First in the Eastern Division Montreal is red hot. They have just swept the Mets. They lead New York by two and a half and the Cubs losing six straight are also two and a half back with St. Louis hanging in trailing by four and a half. In the Western Division, Houston beat the Giants Tuesday and yesterday to close to within two. Cincinnati is third, four and a half back, and San Diego and the Dodgers are tied for fourth, eight and a half back. Now let's turn to Tim McCarver, talk about the San Francisco Giants, and obviously we must start with the dynamic duo, Will Clark and Kevin Mitchell. Well, Al, I think everybody saw how successful their Cross Bay rivals were last year. The Oakland A's, the Bash brothers with Conseco and McGuire. Well, this year, the San Francisco Giants can have their bragging rights with Will Clark and Kevin Mitchell. I guess you could call it willpower. The Pacific Stock Exchange. Che check out Will Clark's average, 345, third behind Tony Gwynn of the, in the National League. 25 home runs leads the National League for Kevin Mitchell, and 70 RBIs leads Major League Baseball. And if you're scoring runs, you've got to have somebody to come in and close. Well, the Giants didn't have a closer earlier this year, but they went out 11 days ago and got Steve Bedrosian from the Philadelphia Phillies. Steve Bedrosian, five saves in his first five appearances. He did, however, lose on Tuesday night, but that's going to happen a short minute. A lot of people, Al, are talking about uh, possibly a Bay World Series, and it could very well happen with Oakland and San Francisco going as well as they have been going. Certainly the Giants uh, strengthening themselves with the acquisition of Bedrosian. And as we turn now to Jim Palmer, let's talk about the Chicago Cubs. And we've seen them uh, three times now in the last four Thursday night telecasts. Are they contenders or pretenders at this point? What are they? Well, they have been disappointing, Al. And the one thing I think about the Cubs, here's a team that was 9-23 and 23 in spring training, yet they're 40-35 and 35 after 75 games. So they've struggled. They have to go back to 1949, the last time they lost six games in Wrigley Field and only scored seven runs. If you're Don Zimmer, you ask yourself, why are we not scoring runs, and what am I going to do about it? Well, why is probably Doug Drabeck of the Pittsburgh Pirates. He pitched a great game against them. They went up to Montreal. They saw Martinez, Langston, and Kevin Gross. Very tough to score runs off them. And then, of course, what do you do to get out of a slump? They've made five major lineup changes. Barry Hill, Dunstan, Ryan Sandberg, uh, the right fielder, Andre Dawson. And then you have the kid. And they, they just went to some young guys. I don't even know their names, but they're going to be playing tonight. <laughs> I suppose maybe we'll call it that they're not ready for primetime players when we get to the starting lineup, which we'll do in a moment when we come back. Tonight's pitching matchup is Paul Kilgus for the Cubs and Scott Gorell for the Giants. Thursday Night Baseball, brought to you by Michelob. One taste will tell you why the night belongs to Michelob. By Kellogg's Just Right, no other cereal is just right. By Olympic, these guys are smart. And by Turtle Wax for that eye-catching, head-turning, double-taking, no-mistaking turtle wax shine. Crowd still settling in at Candlestick Park where they expect about 20,000 tonight for the Giants and the Cubs. Cub lineup, Jerome Walton, the rookie, leads off in center, and Curtis Wilkerson gets the start at second base with the rookie Dwight Smith in right field in this revamped lineup. Mark Grace remains in the lineup at first. Lloyd McClendon makes his first major league start at third base. The left fielder is Mitch Webster hitting in the sixth spot. Dunstan is on the bench tonight, so Domingo Ramos is the shortstop. Joe Girardi does the catching. 
And on the mound is the acquisition from the Rangers, Paul Kilgus, who came over in the deal that included Rafael Palmero and Mitch Williams. For the Giants, Kevin Mitchell in left. Danell Nixon starts in center. Brett Butler getting a rest. Candy Maldonado in right. The rookie Greg Litton at third. Jose Uribe at short. Robbie Thompson at second. And Will Clark at first. The catcher is Terry Kennedy. And pitching for the Giants tonight is Scott Gurrell, who has been double tough in this ballpark. And he very much mirrors what the Giants have done this season. Terrific at home and good enough on the road. And the game begins with a breaking ball low, ball one. Garelt facing Walton is one of those pitchers who, through the minor leagues, came up as a starter. Then they made him a reliever. He went into the rotation in 85 for about a half a season. Back to the bullpen, and now he starts again. And he's doing a great job. You talked about at home. Five and one with an ERA under a run a game. He struggled on the road, but we're here at his home park, San Francisco Candlestick Park. Popped up, shallow right. Thompson goes out on the manicured grass to make the catch. And there's one away. You said it best. He was a reliever. He's led the San Francisco Giants in saves the last four years. But for the first time this year as a starter, he's learned to pitch. Not just throwing the ball. Overpowering type of guy that he can come in and strike out uh, as a reliever almost a guy in innings but hasn't done that this year not only was Gorelts a a reliever he was a short reliever which meant that he only went an inning an inning and a half at the most two innings Curtis Wilkerson on an appeal checks his swing and the count is one and oh Wilkerson is a switch hitter with Sandberg getting rested tonight Curtis in the lineup as a left-handed batter He's hitting 273. By far his better side. Uribe backhands in the hole and then has no play. Would have been tough anyway to throw out Wilkerson even had he fielded it cleanly. So the Cubs get a man on with one out and it will bring up Dwight Smith. Left-handed batters had that step, step and a half advantage when they hit a ball to the right of the shortstop. Uribe does not have a strong throwing arm. He's much stronger coming in on the ball, getting rid of the ball quickly. And as you said, Al, that would have been a tough play for him the way Wilkerson runs. Hit all the way. Dwight Smith, who started the season in the minors, and here at the end of June winds up in the number three spot with the big club, and he's one of the few Cubs who has been hitting. As Jim mentioned, just seven runs in the six losses at home, and that has precipitated all of the lineup changes tonight with Barry Hill and Dawson and Law and Sandberg and Dunstan on the bench, but Smith stays in. Yeah, they all get healthy and they all stop hitting. Best hmm. bench in the National League, though, tonight. One way to look at it. Yeah, isn't that the truth? As you, <laughs> as you work your way down to the seventh, eighth, and ninth, I mean, this game could come down to Bedrosian against Dawson and Sandberg off the bench. The 0 1 pitch missing in the count, one ball and one strike. It's a little overcast, and that's helpful for the hitters right now because were we to have had a high sky and you can see the cloud cover here, it makes it a little easier for the hitters. If there was bright sunshine, we think back to the All Star game in 1984, which was played at this time of day and established an All Star game record for most strikeouts. Of course, you'll see that again this year, the All-Star game being in Anaheim. You saw it last year in Oakland. The All-Star game in Oakland right across the bay last year. Two years ago, that's right. Breaking ball low, and the count two balls and one strike. How soon we forget Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. Garel to throws a fastball, a kind of a slur, which is in between a curveball and a slider. And then as everybody that pitches for Roger Craig throws the split-fingered fastball. Wilkerson at first as Garel comes to the plate and it's ripped into right field for a base hit. Maldonado over to play it back in as Wilkerson moves to third. And so the Cubs, trying to bust out of their slump with a makeshift lineup, have runners at first and third. 
one out against Gorelt, who's coming off a very poor start. He was lit up in San Diego on Sunday. And you talked about Smith hitting, and he's not going to miss these type of pitches. Breaking ball up in the middle of the plate. You can see the concentration, and he rips it into right field. That's the idea of when you're in a slump. If you got that pitch and popped it up or hit it at somebody, then you're worried. The Cubs don't seem to be very uptight about this slump. They're uptight the fact they lost six games and you can't get those back. Mark Grace, who came off the disabled list last week, he had a slightly separated shoulder, hit the line drive over the leaping Uribe to give Chicago the lead as Wilkerson scores. The ball is kicked away by Mitchell, and the throw to third is too late, and down to second goes Grace. So give Grace a single and a run batted in, and then Mitchell will get an error, and the Cubs are runners at second and third as Smith needs an extra moment at third. Needs might be appropriate because it looked like when he dived into third base that he hurt his left knee. But good base running by Smith, he gave himself every opportunity to take the extra base because he rounded second. Grace did the same thing at first base, and now instead of first and second where the double plays in order, then you have second and third and one out, the prospects of a much bigger inning. Kevin Mitchell looked up before he had the ball. And an error on Kevin Mitchell. Also bothered by a bad knee. Probably makes it a little bit harder to get down. No excuse for not making the play, but there you see the end result. Two runners in scoring position, one nothing. We said Gorelts with an ERA here under a run a game. Fly ball will give it over that earned run average, at least the normal earned run average he has here at Candlestick Park. 1-0 Chicago. The giant infield now halfway with McClendon at the plate. And the pitch low and outside, ball one. We can see the positioning of Uribe and Thompson. And depending upon how hard the ball is hit, that will determine what they'll do with it. And now Robbie moves back a bit at second base. As McClendon pops it up in foul territory, playable for Greg Litton. And that's the very big second out as Litton stays with it to retire McClendon. So two down, and now Mitch Webster coming up with Smith at third and Grace at second. Excellent pitch by Gerrelts. As we said, a power pitcher, so he can strike you out, also pop you up. McClendon, an aggressive hitter, went out of the strike zone and gets the pop-up. Mitch Webster, switch hitter, as a left-handed batter, 238 from the other side 326 so Garrell's trying to get out of a shaky first without any more damage misses away ball one one and all the Giants may be trying to pitch around Mitch Webster but it's different pitching around the hitter with a runner at third throw a ball in the dirt wild pitch Burrell says four wild pitches, and that's one of the bad side effects about that split finger fastball. The ball in the dirt, the catcher has to anticipate the ball in the dirt. You see Don Zimmer and Roger Craig, and they're very familiar with each other. So familiar, in fact, the two played golf today here in San Francisco with the Giants owner Bob Lurie and Bob Kennedy. And now with the count, three balls and no strikes, they're not going to fool around and risk the wild pitch on ball four. So it's an intentional walk to Webster with two on. With two out and the base is loaded here in the first inning and Domingo Ramos coming to the plate. Again with Dunstan out of the lineup, Ramos gets the start. He's done well in his limited duty this season, hitting 280. And with the bases loaded, five for 10. for a strike. 0 and 1. So Gorel said at 92 miles per hour. No percentage move. If you make good pitches, looks like you're a genius. If you hang a slider, it'll be three or four runs. 0 and 2. Smith at third. Grace at second. Webster at first. Two out. First inning. 
Cubs on top, one to nothing. So the Cubs in the first settle for one. And after a half, it's Chicago one, San Francisco coming up. Center field. And Robbie Thompson having an excellent year at second base, batting second. Then you've got Will Clark batting third. And Kevin Mitchell hitting fourth at potent one-two punch, hitting third and fourth with Candy Maldonado in right field batting fifth. The rookie, Greg Litton, is the third baseman. Terry Kennedy starting tonight because Kurt Manwaring is on the bench. He's the catcher. Jose Uribe at shortstop. And Scott Geralt is the pitcher. Normally the Giants platoon back of the plate with Kennedy facing the right-handers. But Manwaring injured, uh, available to pinch hit, but on the bench at least at the outset tonight. Webster, Walton, and Smith in the outfield. McLendon makes his first major league start at third. Ramos at short. Wilkerson at second. And Grace at first. Joe Girardi is the Cub catcher. And on the mound is left-hander Paul Kilgus, whose numbers are not very impressive. But Don Zimmer was saying before the game if he can just throw out his starts against Montreal, he's been excellent. The Expos have killed him. No pun intended. As Kilgus delivers to Nixon outside, ball one, one and oh. That's the kind of career he had last year, 12 and 15, with Texas, his first year in the big leagues. And he's 27, really has only started 44 games in his life. So a lot older chronologically than he is from an experienced standpoint. 0 and 1 against the Giants, but he's 0 and 3 against Montreal. Eight and two thirds innings. He's given up 16 earned runs against the Expos. Speaking of the Expos, if you were to stop the race today and start the playoffs, Donnell Nixon would go into the playoffs and face his brother, Otis, who plays for the Expos. With Montreal and the Giants on top in their respective divisions. Fly ball to right field, and Smith backs up to make the catch. So Nixon taken care of, one out in the first inning, and the batter will be Robbie Thompson. The one difficulty that Paul Kilgus has had, he said, he, number one, he's new catchers, new league. He said in the American League, he used to throw a lot more curveballs and change-ups when he got behind, similar to the 2-1 count. Here, he's gone with a fastball, and he's been hurt with it. So trying to change his style of pitching hasn't worked. Robbie Thompson takes a strike. Thompson kind of the unsung giant with so much of the publicity for Mitchell and Will Clark and Roger Craig but it's Thompson who uh, relatively silently is having an all-star first half he's third in the ballot breaking pitch a strike and sometimes it takes the fans a couple of years to catch up and in Thompson's case they have to understand that uh, well you still got Ryan Sandberg who is thought of as the premier second baseman in the league and until he would begin to falter, Thompson would be relegated to second or third or fourth in the balloting as he grounds to short and Ramos throws him out. Two down. And speaking of Sandberg, there he is on what is, uh, as Jim said before, about as potent a bench as you'll ever see tonight. Not a happy bench, though. Even though I think when you go two for 40, as Ryan has, and he's been struggling, much better player than that, you don't want him to, uh, a night off, but sometimes it helps you. So Zimmer knows that. He's been baseball over 40 years. I'm sure he went through a few two for 40s. Two out. Will Clark takes a breaking pitch away. Ball one. I guess it's like a painter who gets cl too close to his painting, son. He has to stand back and look at things. I think that's what Zim is doing with Dawson and Sandberg tonight, giving them a little bit different look. Clark, the bouncer to second. Wilkerson throws to Grace. And Kilgus has a 1 2 3 inning at the end of one. It remains Cubs 1, Giants nothing. Back in San Francisco after this message and a word from our ABC station. We talked during the open to the telecast about the problems the Giants have had with their rotation. Dave Drevecki, and that's a whole other story which we'll get into tonight. 
is on the DL. So is Kelly Downs, who's expected to pitch a simulated game tomorrow. Mike Kruko will be examined by Dr. Gordon Campbell within a day or two. He's on the 15-day disabled list. And Atlee Hamaker is due back shortly. But all four of those men currently on the disabled list. And there is the Giants' current four-man rotation. Russell, Geralt, Don Robinson, and Mike Lacoste. And they'll go with the rookie, Trevor Wilson, making his first Major League start tomorrow. Meanwhile, here's Joe Girardi leading off in the second with a count, no balls and two strikes. Big start for Trevor. He pitches well. He may go in the rotation. And Gareltz takes care of Girardi. So Gareltz begins the second inning the way he ended the first by striking Ramos out with the bases loaded. Gets the leadoff man here. And Paul Kilgus, who is two for 27, comes to the plate. The scary thing, I would think, for the other teams in the Western Division, when and if Kruko comes back 100%, and Hammerker comes back, and Downs comes back, and if they can get Dravecki back before the end of the season, and amazingly, that may be possible. With the acquisition of Bedrosian and the problems the other teams in the division are having, the Giants have, I think at this point, at least in my mind, become very much the team to beat in the West. Oh, they have, and also, I think you gotta examine the other teams in the division done a great job he's had 10 different starters 16 Roger Craig the manager of the Giants Kilgus hits it softly down to Clark who shovels to Garrell's covering and that's the second down two down and Jerome Walton coming to the plate the Giants have used 16 different pitchers this year 10 starters and I think a guy who struggled as a pitcher like Rod Roger Craig is more able to understand going from the bullpen to being a starter like Garrelts is doing tonight. Roger Craig did that throughout his entire career. Played on four world championship teams. As a matter of fact, he was a teammate of Don Zimmer in 1962 with the original Mets. He was a coach for Don Zimmer. Don Zimmer was a coach for him. They've known each other since the, the early 50s. Not only the way he has manipulated the rotation, but the way he has used his pitchers. To me, one of the more incredible stats I have seen in recent times is the fact that the Giant pitching staff has 11 shutouts this season, and only one is a complete game. The other 10 are combined. Grounded to short, Uribe takes care of Walton, and after a shaky first, a perfect second for Scott Garrell. Still 1-0 Cubs, end of one and a half. Zimmer and Craig. We mentioned the, the long history, the fact that one managed while the other coached, and, and that has happened on both sides of the coin in San Diego and here. And now opposing each other at Candlestick Park is Kevin Mitchell stands in. Mitchell with 25 home runs, leading the majors, having a sensational year. And most of his home runs have been of the no doubt of variety. In fact, he hit one uh, one of those at San Diego the other day. Uh, only the tenth home run ever hit into the second deck at Jack Murphy Stadium. And a lot of people attribute it to the bat that he uses. Talking to Dusty Baker, the hitting instructor uses a 35 to 36 ounce bat. Will Clark uses a 34, 32 ounce, 34 inches length. Not too many guys can swing a bat that big with that kind of bat speed. He, of course, is a most interesting story. And, Tim, you were there with the Mets when he broke in, a utility man, subsequently traded to San Diego. And then up here, as Mitchell goes after a breaking pitch and pops it in the air to shallow right field, Wilkerson goes out and stays with it to make the catch. But the one-time utility man now <laughs> I don't want to say chasing Ruth and Maris, but the, there have been enough uh, comparisons already in most papers around the country. Yeah, and you look at Kevin's minor league record. He had 10 home runs in 1982, 14 in 1983. He has 25 home runs, and here it is June. He's never hit that many in the minor leagues or the major leagues. His most was 22 in 1987. He had seven for San Diego, and then the trade on July 4th, he had 15 for the Giants. Here's Maldonado standing. And I think it's always fun, though, when a guy like Mitchell gets off to that sort of start because in papers around the country, 
Uh, they begin normally in early June, the comparisons with how many Ruth had a, at a particular time and how many Maris had at a particular time and so forth. And Kevin McGuire. Back to Mark McGuire two years ago. Ended up with 49. One and one account. Well, they've done it through the years with some former Giants as well with this franchise and its illustrious history with Mel Ott and Willie Mays and Willie McCovey. Kevin said he went to contacts. Of course, he only wears them every maybe two out of three days. Some days he feels like wearing them up here with a wind. Difficult to wear contact lenses on a regular basis. One ball and one strike on Maldonado. Maldonado not having a good year, hitting 203. He's had a frankly very disappointing year, and Craig right now has him platooning in right field with Pat Sheridan, who came over from Detroit a couple of weeks ago. As Maldonado rips it in the left field for a base hit. And I think the fact that Maldonado has been hitting poorly is going to eventually wear on Kevin Mitchell. Will Clark has the better chance to have a good year because Mitchell hits behind Clark. The Giants have had a very difficult time finding a fifth place hitter. If Candy Maldo Maldonado was the Maldonado of two years ago, well, then he would be the perfect number five hitter behind Mitchell, but they don't have one yet. Well, as Litton stands in, when they, when they look ahead, they, they wish that the future was now because they do have their number five hitter. They think he's in Phoenix. He's been up twice. The Giants admitting that they've, they've brought him up on two occasions too early, and we're talking about Matt Williams and the way he's going in Phoenix. It would not be surprising to see Williams here around the All-Star break. Litton swings and misses. In fact, right now they've got Litton at the plate and Riles, Ernest Riles, platooning at third. So if Williams can come up and do the job, he would not only be the everyday third baseman, but the everyday number five hitter. If, if, if. <laughs> Chop foul. Oh, again, two. you know they need that because they gave him the opportunity. Roger Craig played him most of spring training, and then he ended with an 0 for 18. You know, a guy that worked with Mackie Shillstone talking about Matt Williams, trying to get a better conditioning program to be able to play third base in the big leagues level. What has he got, 15 home runs at Phoenix already? So it's paid off down there. No balls, two strikes to count on Linton. Maldonado at first base with one out. And it's ripped to the gap in right center field for extra bases. Maldonado will be waved in. He will score. Linton, the rookie, is on his way to third with a game time triple. Litton's first triple of the year, his first major league triple, his first major league home run. Interesting this year, he borrowed a bat from Tony Gwynn of the San Diego Padres and commits to hit a home run against the Padres. And now he comes up, and I believe that's Tony Gwynn's bat right there. His bat is so white, as a matter of fact, that they, the, the Giants didn't have any in stock. You mentioned bat weight. His bat weighs 30 ounces. It looks like a little toy. Kennedy with the infield in waves in a breaking ball. 0 oh 1 the count. Cub infield is in again. Kennedy is platooned with Kurt Manwaring as Kennedy steps out to look at Bill Fahey and Roger Craig, certainly not averse to squeezing. And with one out and a man at third, it's a distinct possibility especially against the left-hander. But he swings away and gets a base hit to get the Giants a two-to-one lead. So Kennedy, who's only in the lineup because of the finger injury, the man wearing, delivers lefty against lefty, and the Giants lead two-to-one in the second inning. Well, Kennedy himself has a split finger. He split the right index finger on his right hand Obviously, most right index fingers are on your right hand, right? <laughs> I think that was a little redundant. Last Friday night, so he's actually having problems. As a matter of fact, all three of the giant catchers have one problem or another. Bill Bass, the third catcher with shoulder problems, man wearing with a thumb, 
and Kennedy with the right index finger. Like I said, everybody up here has a split finger. Yeah. Everybody that catches for the Giants. Huh? These days. <laughs> Jose Uribe at the plate. Uribe, switch hitter, better from the other side. He's hitting only 198 right-handed. And checks his swing. They appeal no, says the first base umpire, Bill Hahn. One and one. Got a look at the... Check swing by Uribe and an interesting thing with Paul Gil Gilgis we told you he is struggling he has changed his windup from the one he had in the American League he has what you call a slide step look how wide his stance is there's no leg kick now he said that's that's given me problems yet with Maldonado at first who can't run he went to the slide step we saw a triple to Kelly to with a man on third in a non-running situation he went to the slide step as Jeff Pico warms up you got a the single by Kennedy. So here's the guy that last year was very successful, other than maybe 19 innings in the American League. He's changed his lineups, and you can see right there he has not made good pitches, hasn't been able to get hitters out when it counts. No leg kick whatsoever. One-two pitch. Uribe takes in the dirt, blocked by Girardi in the count two and two. I think pitchers rely on that slide step too much. They fall in love with it and sacrifice power, and it appears that that's what killed this is power doing. location. Now, it's all right if a guy can run, but can Maldonado run? No. Kennedy can't either, and yet Mark yeah. Gray's holding him on. And he told me he's not winding up like he did. He thinks it hurts him, and it's affected his pitching performance. It's softly in the left field. That's a base hit. Kennedy will pull in at second, and the Giants have four successive hits after Kilgus had begun the game by retiring the first four Giants. And Don Zimmer already with activity in the bullpen and the makeshift lineup. And this is the last thing that Zimmer wanted to do tonight. Make a visit to the mound in the second inning. Don Zimmer comes out. We'll take another look at Kilgus's windup. Now, last year in the American League for Texas, he had a leg kick. Wide stance. Hardly any at all. You lose power. You lose location. Four straight hits. And that'll be your last look at Kilgus tonight. As he comes out, and Jeff Pico comes in from the bullpen. So the Giants lead it by a score of 2-1, to one, and the Cubs go to the bullpen. Paul Kilgus lasts only an inning and a third, and here is Jeff Pico coming out of the bullpen in a situation in which the Giants lead 2-1, to one, and the Giants have runners at first and second with one out. And the pitcher, Scott Garelt, coming up in a punch situation with Terry Kennedy at second and Jose Uribe at first. A reminder, the U.S. Senior Open this weekend. Saturday coverage begins 2.30 Eastern and Pacific, 1.30 Central. Al Guyberger has the first round lead. Scott Garrell stands in. Grace and McLendon are shortened up, and he swings away and rips it to right field for extra bases by the skidding Smith. That scores Kennedy. Uribe is waved in. He will score. And how often do you see a pitcher get a triple? Garrell to third. And hurts himself as he goes into third as well. So this is a good news, bad news scene for the Giants. The triple to drive in two to make it four to one. But what about Garelt's left leg or knee? I think Roger Craig's probably thinking right now, I wish he'd have hit into a double play or get out of the inning. Because right now, even at the expense of driving in two runs, the Giants, more than anything else, can't afford to have a pitcher go down on them. Ball getting by Dwight Smith. Played it very poorly. Take another look and see that happened on the swing. We follow him down to first base. And Garelt is going to have to come out. Yeah, triples are dangerous for pitchers. Doubles are dangerous enough. But managers, it looked like right in there somewhere about halfway between first and second. 
Durrell's lost his stride, broke stride, and now grabs his hamstring. But it looked like the extension between first and second was where he hurt it. But that's a dangerous hit for a triple because they're not used to running the bases full extension like that. Roger Craig had already gone to his lineup card as if to indicate to plate umpire Gary Darling he wanted to make a change and then plucked it in his back pocket or did a moment ago. Now he has it out again. Garrels is trying to remain in the game at third. This is a scene that Roger played the other night as well with Rick Russell in Houston. Russell's had a groin pull and in fact when Craig went out to check Russell's who subsequently did come have to come out of the game. Craig was thrown out of the game by Bruce Freming. And Garrels is going to test that leg. Yeah, it's a left leg. It's not the one you push off. Obviously, you could hurt yourself landing on it if, you, if it stiffens up. But he's looking at the scoreboard four to one. <laughs> he doesn't want to come out of there. That's right. If he does, <laughs> you've got every giant starting pitcher hanging from the dugout saying, I, I can handle this with a three-run lead in the second inning. I'll be glad to go in. But it did look like between first and second. Oh, you called it right. He grabbed it. And now you don't know, as I think we're going to get a pinch runner. You know, emotionally, you want to stay in. You look at, a, here's a guy that's pitched well here. He's got a four to one lead. Jeff Brantley will come in. But he'll Craig wants to win the game. Yeah, he'll come in as a pinch runner. <laughs> a rarity. How many, how many times do you see a pitcher pinch running in the second inning? This is an interesting uh, case here, too. I'm wondering about the rule in regard to the fact that you replace a pitcher who injures himself, you get all the time you need to warm up. But in effect, he's replacing him as a pinch runner. So when he goes to the mound before the third inning, does he get the time he needs? I would say yes. Yeah, I would too. So Garrell has to come out. The Giants have five consecutive hits. So both starters are gone for distinctly different reasons. Kilgus and Garrels are out of the game. It's Pico against Brantley now, with Brantley taking over at third. And the reason it's Brantley who pinch runs here is Craig just doesn't want to waste a body in the second inning as a pinch runner. Infield plays in. And Nixon is the batter. Ball one, one and no. Bill Fahey flashing the sign. In retrospect, great play by Roger Craig letting Gerelts hit away in a bunt situation. Split foul in the count of one and one. You know, you know you're going to get a fastball because it's a bunt situation, usually up in the strike zone. And what does he do? Smith played it into a triple as you look at Bay, Bill Fay hitting. Tell you, both of these managers are unpredictable, but I, you talk about courage. It would be a lot of courage on Craig's part to put on the squeeze with Brantley at third base after you're one of your number one starters goes down on you. Right, and you know he's not fully warm. Right. So no chance of a squeeze right here, and no chance of the pitcher running in on a ground ball with the infield in. You wouldn't think so. You, you, no. just want, you wouldn't want to do that to Brantley and risk the injury. Perfect situation for Nixon, because if he gets on, he can run. You got the infield in, let him swing away. If he hits it by him, you probably have a, a double. Now that we've said that, I'm sure we'll have a squeeze. <laughs> there it goes. Here we go. Yeah, exactly. What else is still Perfect punt, and the Giants lead it five to one, and Nixon is safe at first. Well, I'm glad I prefaced that with these managers are unpredictable, right? Because that's one of their strengths. You just can't predict what Craig or Zimmer will do. Well, what's predictable is the count, two and one. You know you're going to get a strike, so if you're going to squeeze, it's a great pitch to do it on. And here you see it from up above, from high home. Brantley. Kind of started. <laughs> it was a very tentative. On a squeeze, you come hard. We said not loose, and you get another run. So the Giants lead 5 1. Thompson's the batter. And the funny thing is, it may sound crazy, but if you're going to squeeze there, make it a suicide squeeze where you really don't have to sprint. On a safety squeeze, you might have to. Now Brantley's going to go down and warm up some more in the bullpen. And so Brantley has come in to score a run. And he, of course, will be the pitcher of record once he comes into the game and the beneficiary of at least a four-run lead. Giants still hitting in the second with one out. Nixon can run seven out of eight. Only been caught once. Nixon at first base. One out. 
a five ball two two and oh it's, it's, it's so funny to see the Giants squeezing because in the years when Horace Stoneham owned the team the Giants they lost some critical game with a squeeze and the word got out to all Giants managers I don't want to see the squeeze and the Giants went I don't know what it was but it was something like 10 years without even attempting a squeeze bunt and you knew when teams would protect against the squeeze that they hadn't done their homework the Giants just never did it and then Bob Lurie took over as the owner of the team well, and look at the and players a story. look at the players the Giants had too Orlando Cepeda Willie McCovey Bobby Bonds Willie Mays they didn't have the squeezable type of players that were adaptable to the squeeze bunt or any bunt for that matter Cepeda, the rookie of the year in 58. Willie McCovey, rookie of the year in 59. Boy, did they trait some outfielders through this organization. Jim Ray Hart. 60s and 70s, yes, sir. Kenny Henderson. Three and one on Thompson. And he is a high drive to deep left center field. All the way back. effect is nothing but a loud wail for Don Zimmer whose team has lost six in a row and trailed by six in the second inning and you know why you get a strike there right here Will Clark man on first it's five to one Robbie Thompson it's ninth home run which a lot of home runs for a little guy but you're going to have to pitch to him if he's on deck still only one out and Clark rips it into right field for a base hit and the Giants have eight consecutive hits. The major league record in one inning for consecutive hits is 10. And the Giants have eight. A single by Maldonado, a triple by Litton, a single by Kennedy, a single by Oribe, a triple by Garels, a single by Nixon, a homer by Thompson, a single by Clark. Well, as you said in the first inning, Robbie Thompson does so many things for you. Right here. You're in a bad area right yeah. there, believe me. Kind of an unusual play. Stopping like that. That happened to me with the bases loaded July 4th, 1976, when I passed Gary Maddox at first base. That's an embarrassing situation. And that almost happened to Thompson, but he did pull up in time. In the bullpen, Les Lancaster, who was called up. When Pat Perry went on the disabled list, a Lancaster up from the minors and probably into the game, and that is the case. So Pico faces four batters, gives up four hits. It's seven to one. Giants, and we'll be back after this. Mitchell will come up with still only one out in the second inning. Clark and Mitchell. Here's what Roger Craig said about them before the game. Well, you know, you, you think of the guys, the, the Maris and Mantle and Matthews and Aaron and I guess Babe Ruth and Gehrig, and you look at these guys and it's just unbelievable. I'm very fortunate to be their manager to, and to sit and be able to watch it every day. You know, they've driven in, uh, gosh, I don't know how many runs and hit home runs, but we now we're finally getting some, we're not finally, but we're getting some help from a lot of other people contributing. Robbie Thompson, the Reebies, the Kennedys, the Manwaring, and my bench has been very strong. But without Mitchell and Clark, we'd be in trouble oddly enough the only out in the inning off the bat of Kevin Mitchell since he popped the second eight consecutive hits and a breaking pitch misses outside ball one the all-time record several teams as you can see with 10 consecutive hits in an inning the last time 1983 Detroit and that's the only time it's been done in 59 years As Mitchell pops it in the air to shallow right field. Go figure. Kevin Mitchell has now made the only two outs in the inning as Smith makes the catch. 
and Clark retreats to first. So two down, and Candy Maldonado, who started the hit parade, comes to the plate. Had Kevin hit into a double play, he would have made all three <laughs> outs in the inning, and I don't think I've ever heard of anybody doing that. That, that is a rarity. <laughs> Kevin was swinging the bat in the Houston clubhouse the other day and ended up hitting Bob Lillis accidentally. And Bob went down, cut his chin, and he is sporting a Band-Aid on his chin. And you saw Mitchell smiling there. There's no doubt in that giant dugout, which is very loose right now. They're giving him a little bit of grief. Like, you know, what are you doing here, pal? One and no to count. Who needs you, huh? <laughs> Here's Lillis. You'll see him in a moment sporting uh, a little bit of a, a little mark. The Band-Aid's still covering it. There it is. One and one. Les Lancaster called up from the minors last week to the Cubs with Kilgus starting. Pico out of the pen didn't get anybody out. And Lancaster, the third Chicago pitcher. And again, the Giants will have Brantley going to the mound in the top of the third as it's fouled away. Talk about inheriting a fortune. If you're Scott Brantley, you're coming into the game as the pitcher of record with a 6-1 lead. I'd be nervous. Happy and nervous. You know, the thing about Mitchell and Clark is they both give cre credit to Brett Butler, who we're not seeing, and Robbie Thompson, who so we saw hit the home run. He said they have to pitch to us if those two guys get on. And they have. Not tonight, but all year. Just inside on Maldonado, who crowds the plate. Two and two. And the count goes to three and two. So full count, two down. Clark will be taking off from first base, and Grace will play behind him. Thinking about hitting into three outs in the inning, I guess you could do that with a triple play, but rarely do you make a normal out and then have a double play mm -hmm. follow. That is very unusual. And the 3-2 pitch is hit foul. And speaking of unusual, with the Reds pulling off a triple play last night against Atlanta, it's the first Cincinnati triple play in 22 years, and the other one, the last one, featured Mr. McCarver. Yeah, May 20th, 1967. Phil Gagliano was the hitter with obviously nobody out. Orlando Cepeda on third. One hopper to Leo Cardenas. He looked Cepeda back, turned the double play. Cepeda broke late to home, and with that triple play, in the ninth inning to end the game, Cincinnati went into first place. Clark goes, and the 3-2 pitch is lifted to shallow right field. Grace and Wilkerson go out, and it's Wilkerson making the catch. So a nightmarish inning comes to an end for Chicago. Giants send 11 men to the plate, score 7, and lead 7-1, end of 2. Thursday Night Baseball, brought to you by the new generation of Oldsmobile. Step into the future, now at your Oldsmobile dealer. So here we go to the third inning with Jeff Brantley on the mound for the Giants. And the first pitch to Wilkerson is over for a strike. I think I called him Scott Brantley. Already thinking about football season. Scott Brantley, the linebacker. I think the Cubs feel like they've been hit by a bunch of linebackers at this point. Seven points for the Giants in the bottom <laughs> of the second. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and all in one inning. In it's this, not like they split it up. In this, the home of the NFL champion 49ers. Yeah. That's what I was thinking about. <laughs> One and two. Wilkerson takes outside. Two balls and two strikes. There is Andre Dawson. Again, he gets the night off. Sandberg the night off, at least in a in a starting role. Ferry Hill, Dunstan, and Law. And when you're Don Zimmer and you've lost six in a row and you've only scored seven runs, I guess there are two things to do. You make a massive lineup switch, which you did tonight. Well, you just throw some darts to the board and come up with a lineup that way or pick it out of a hat. Well, the one thing they've had is pitching. And you look up there, you see seven run second inning. Frightening. Wilkerson got on strikes. So one down in the third inning, and Dwight Smith will be the batter. Reminder Saturday on Wide World of Sports. The Bislett International Track and Field Meet 
from Oslo. Carl Lewis will be there. Roger Kingdom will be there. And Steve Cram as well. And coverage of the Tour de France begins. High fly ball to deep left center field, but playable for Mitchell on the warning track to pull it in. Two down. It's a lot easier tonight. Again, a look at the lineup for Wide World on Saturday. A lot easier tonight for the outfielders because of the cloud cover that we mentioned, and that has diminished what would be normally a ferocious wind that would blow through Candlestick Park, especially in the late afternoon and early evening. And there's the overcast, which has created very placid conditions here. As Grace hits one down the left field line foul, 0-1 talked about that earned run average and uh, 186 here at home over four runs talking about the Giants pitching staff and I asked Dusty Baper why don't guys like to hit here he said they squint they come to the park in a depressed state of mind because what you said it's going to be windy not great conditions to hit Grace it's a high fly ball in the center field Nixon fades back and makes the catch and so Brantley comes out of the pen a one two three inning at the end of two and a half it remains seven one Giants updating the scores for you the Montreal Expo seeking their seventh win in the road leading Houston to one nothing in the third Atlanta and the Reds are tied at Riverfront of the eighth San Diego and the Dodgers later the Red Sox have won today defeating Milwaukee Toronto leads Baltimore six to one in the fourth the Yankees have the lead over the Tigers Kansas City leads the White Sox in the first California just a game back of Oakland 4 one over Minnesota the Twins have been red hot in the third Seattle and Texas are scoreless in the second. The A's leading the West by a game are off tonight. They begin a weekend series tomorrow in Cleveland. Here, the Giants leading the Cubs 7 to 1 with Greg Litton leading off. And the first pitch missing high ball one. Litton, Kennedy, and Uribe in the third. That was some cavalry charge, wasn't it? <laughs> one and one. There's a fella here, I don't know if we could ever find him in the stands, who plays that kazoo. <laughs> it is. I've just, you talk about the pressure on, on television directors, I've just asked our, our man Craig Janoff, amongst this crowd of about 17,000, to find the guy with the kazoo. Doing one to count. But you'll hear that noise from time to time tonight. Two and two. I don't think there is a worse sound from a musical instrument no. than the sound of a kazoo. Mm -mm. I think that's very appropriately named, a kazoo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it sounds like it's named. Perfect. <laughs> Three and two. Oh, there he is. Oh, boy. Isn't that sweet, yeah. pleasant, nice? Somebody nice. had passed the word to him. 3-2 <laughs> two pitch. He's fouled back. Litton, who tripled in the second inning. And we mentioned before, he and Ernest Ryle, for the moment, platooning at third. As Litton takes ball four. So Litton is aboard for the second time. Leading off the third inning with a walk. And it will bring up Terry Kennedy, who singled the drive and a run in the second. This is a very brief homestand for the Giants and a brief road trip for the Cubs. It's funny, the Giants had been on the road. The Cubs had been at Wrigley. This series here, then the Giants go back on the road and the Cubs go home again until the All-Star break. Kennedy gets under it and hits it to right field. Smith backs up, has a play at the edge of the track, makes the catch. Litton alertly tagging at first and is in safely at second. So it gives Litton some credit and also the first base coach, Wendell Kim, for bringing him back on a drive that Kim knew was going to stay in the park and they take advantage of Litton's speed and advance him into scoring position. That's a play. Also, you need to communicate. You have two guys the first time they were in the big league talking about the center fielder Jerome Walton as you see Greg Litton tag up plays in front of him he could go almost halfway and come back and Smith throw a little bit late again Jerome Walton I don't think he really told him he was tagging up or if he did he didn't pay attention runner in scoring position now Uribe at the plate 
And when you pull something off like that, that's really home park advantage here, too. On a real windy night, it's tough. It would, it would be very tough for Litton and or Kim to gauge where that ball was going to wind up. But with very little wind tonight, Wendell Kim could figure out that the ball would be caught around the edge of the warning track and bring him back to tag up in for a strike in the count one and one. Yeah, there aren't too many uniform plays in this ballpark mm -mm. because of the conditions of the say if there was ever a place appropriately named it's candlestick park mm -hmm. to change it to candle douse park maybe oh it's been called a few things <laughs> in its time some have some have called it a monument to political chicanery some have you're right <laughs> many have <laughs> And on that subject, the Giants have already said that they will play out their option, so to speak. Their lease expires here in 1994. And Bob Lurie says, that's it, folks. We're going to be at a new park in 1995 or Timbuktu. And very shortly, there'll be proposals from both the city of San Francisco and from Santa Clara, which is about a 40-minute drive south of this ballpark. <laughs> we found them. Craig, congratulations. There he is. A marked man. And he'll be taking that kazoo someday to either the downtown stadium or the stadium down by Great America in Santa Clara. The 2-2 pitch is outside, ball three. Les Lancaster, the Cup pitcher, in his third tour of duty. 8-3 a couple of years ago, last year, four and six. Pretty simple. Turns it over, a little bit of a changeup, big breaking ball. Needs an out. Got to stay in the game. Trailing seven to one. And the breaking pitch misses for ball four. So Uribe walks, runners at first and second with one out. And Jeff Brantley coming to the plate. Craig flashing what we would suspect would be the, the bunch sign here. First and second, one out. But, and again, we're dealing with the unpredictable one. Fahey relaying the sign. Oh, well, we saw a fastball last time in Gorelts when he tore his hamstring, hit a triple. I would imagine you may see a breaking ball in this first pitch. When in doubt, hook him. And keep in mind, too, with a man at second, Lloyd McLendon starting his first major league game at third. He swings away. He hits it by the mound. Ramos goes back to Wilkerson to first for a double play. Unorthodox, but it gets the job done. And at the end of three at Candlestick, 7-1 to one, San Francisco. Back we come after this message and news headlines from our ABC stadium. Uh, the best way to play defense and shortstop Domingo Ramos making a terrific play of anticipation to end the third inning for the Giants. And we'll take a look at it in a moment as McClendon is at the plate with the count one ball and no strikes. McClendon, Webster, and Ramos in the fourth. Two balls and no strikes. Brantley with the club earlier in the season, then sent to Phoenix for a couple of weeks and called back up last week and falls behind. Three balls and no strikes. In there. Three and one. McClendon, Webster, and Ramos for the Cubs in the fourth. Line to center field. Nixon charging in, tries to backhand it, but can only short hop it, and it's a base hit for McClendon. Now we'll go back and take a look at the inning-ending double play in the third. Yeah, anticipation also important for a broadcaster, and I anticipated this double play being shown again. Now, this ended the third inning, but look at Ramos. You very, Al said it was unorthodox, and the reason for that, you rarely see a shortstop or a second baseman turn and throw the ball to the pivot man behind him. But because the pitcher was the runner, Ramos figured he had time, and he did. Nicely turned. Good anticipation, huh? And interesting, very good anticipation. <laughs> Great anticipation by the Cubs because it's a bunt situation. Yeah. And you would figure that there was the possibility that Wilkerson would be covering first. But instead, they didn't rotate. Just think if they'd have had the rotation play mm -hmm. on. Shortstop covers third, second baseman mm -hmm. covers first. An RBI single for Brantley. That's what I'm sure Craig had in mind. But Zimmer, outguessing Craig there, keeping his defense in an, in an orthodox state, even though, as I say, it was an unorthodox execution, and he wins that little mini battle.
One ball, one strike to count on Webster, who drew an intentional walk in the first inning. Two and one. Speaking of intentional walks, do you know who leads the National League in intentional walks? Not Kevin Mitchell. Not Darryl Strawberry. Probably some eighth place hitter. You're exactly right. Spike Owen of Montreal. Fouled away. Well, it's always, it's, it, it's one of two guys will always lead. It's a, a slugger who has nobody hitting behind him. Nobody significant or an eighth place hitter. Yeah, will Clark with 27 last year. Mitchell not hitting as well. This year, what, Mitchell has 17, 15, something like that? 15, yeah. I would venture to say playing in the American League, uh, Spike Owen probably doesn't have 18 intentional walks throughout his career before this year. I'll bet not. One hopper to Clark. He goes to Uribe for one and back to Brantley too late. So they settle for the force. Take care of McLendon. Webster is safe at first. So Mitch is there with one out. And Domingo Ramos, who became a father earlier this week. In fact, so did Damon Berryhill. That's about the only good news the Cubs have had in the last seven days. Ramos coming to the plate. Damon and his wife, Ann, having... What a terrific name. Three days ago, had a little baby boy, Joshua Berryhill. Sounds like that was biblically inspired, <laughs> right? Joshua Berryhill. Terrific name. Fouled away. Off to the right. Clark giving chase. Runs out of room. I was reading somewhere. I, I can't remember the exact circumstances, but there, there is Berryhill down in the bullpen with Steve Wilson loosening up for Chicago. There was, there's a Cub fan who is going to name his baby, if it's a boy, Clark Addison, which is the <laughs> intersection at which Wrigley Field is located. That's great. Foul away to the right, and the count 0-2. I, I, I guess that's a better name than Waveland Sheffield, which are the other two streets that are, that are joined Wrigley. and two. Jeff Brantley out of Mississippi State where Will Clark went to school. All right. Also Raphael Palmero traded to Texas. Bobby Thigpen of the Chicago White right. Sox. Mm -hmm. Good program. He fights it off and it's a fly ball to shallow right field. Andy Maldonado makes the play. Just a note to our local stations, we will take a station break for you at the end of this half inning. Fourth inning, two out, seven to one, San Francisco. Webster at first base and Joe Girardi coming to the plate. Giants and Cubs, two story franchises, but two franchises with enormous frustration. The Cub frustration has become legendary. And then you think of the Giants as Girardi grounds it to third. Litton stays with it despite stumbling. And the force of second to retire the side. At the end of three and a half, no frustration for the Giants tonight. They lead it seven to one and will return to Candlestick after this word from our ABC station. Guys, we don't uh, make too many visits to Candlestick Park. Uh, in fact, we've been here so infrequently through the years, but tonight is tank top weather. What a night. You lied. All these years, you told us you were up here doing games, shivering to death. Uh-huh. And you lied. It's beautiful. You're right. People show up on a night like tonight, and they say, what are they talking about? Perfect weather. And it's been a perfect game for the Giants, faithful, whose team leads 7-1 to one in the bottom of the fourth inning. Donnell Nixon with a count one ball and one strike. Nixon getting the start tonight, a couple of reasons. Brett Butler's been struggling a bit of late, so he gets the night off. And Nixon was four for six lifetime against Paul Kilgus, who was the short live Cub starter. So Roger Craig figuring why not rest Brett and give Nixon a chance to play it against Lancaster. You saw those figures. Three and one.
Full count, three and two. Started to talk about the frustration of the, the two franchises. Cubs haven't won a pennant since 1945. Giants have not won a pennant since 1962. Nixon lines it to right field, but right into the glove of Smith. And the batter will be Thompson. And then, of course, to compound it for the Giants, two years ago, they win the West. They lead the Cardinals three games to two. They need one victory in St. Louis, and they don't score a run. Go in and get shut out 1-0 and 6-0, and the Cardinals go to the World Series. The big blow in Game 7, the three-run homer by Jose Oquindo. Mm -hmm. Shut out by Danny Cox. Mm -hmm. And the big play the night before, early in the game, Candy Maldonado slipping and misjudging the fly ball, and it turned out to be the only run of the game. Hit foul down the left field line on the count 0-2. Maybe the overall big play is Jeffrey Leonard hitting those home runs and somewhat showing up the Cardinals, getting them a little bit more motivated. At least that's what they talked about during that World Series. Thompson takes low, one ball and two strikes. Famous one flap down. Mm -hmm. Been trading that around in Seattle. He's having an excellent year. One two to Thompson. Grounded toward the middle. Plugging up the middle is Wilkerson to throw Thompson out. And with two down, Clark comes up. As far as the All-Star balloting is concerned, with the All-Star game coming up in Anaheim in two weeks, Benito Santiago leading the balloting back of the plate. Then you've got Clark. Sandberg was here tonight, but on the bench. Ozzy Smith, as usual. And Mike Schmidt, despite retiring, is still the leading vote getter at third. Kevin Mitchell is now the leading vote getter amongst the outfielders with Strawberry and Gwynn. Clark gets it down to third, and McLendon throws the first to retire on the side, so Lancaster has a 1 2 3 inning. Giants go silently, but they've been noisy to this point as we go to the fifth. 7 1, San Francisco. Fifth inning with Lancaster leading off for Chicago. Swinging and missing in the count quickly. 0-2. Just a footnote to the Bislett track and field meet, which you'll see on Wide World Saturday. That meet always lending itself to sparkling times and super performances as Lancaster goes down on strikes. And Carl Lewis, Roger Kingdom, Steve Cram amongst those you'll see in action on Wide World this Saturday. One out in the fifth inning, and Jerome Walton coming to the plate. If you joined us late, the Cubs got a run in the first. Chicago going with a patchwork lineup tonight as Don Zimmer tries to shake them up. But in the bottom of the second inning, the Giants sent 11 men to the plate, scored seven runs, but lost Scott Gurels in the process. And Jeff Brantley came into pitch in the third inning, inheriting a six-run lead. And it has been fun for the Giants tonight and through the course of the season as they begin the evening with the best record in the majors. By a diving lit for a base hit. So Walton is aboard with a single. The Cubs have collected five hits. They have all been singled. And it will bring up Curtis Wilkerson. National League, Montreal seeking its seventh straight. Gerald Perry, who had not driven in a run since late April, finally snaps out of that drought tonight. 2-1 over Cincinnati, and the Reds at the moment trail by five. Padres and Dodgers a little bit later. Wilkerson takes a strike. So at the moment, factoring in the Cincinnati defeat tonight, the Giants leading Houston by two, Reds by five. Oh and two. Yeah, it's an amazing team. Remember you talked about a, uh, Roger Craig being aggressive, unusual. I mean, the third time, first time in 17 years, he's had three successive winning records up here. I, mean, I think last year, all the injuries, they were 83 and 79. How'd they pull that off? I mean, it's just incredible. And here's a guy who, when he left, Detroit. He was the pitching coach there under Sparky Anderson. He loves Southern California. He lives out in a remote region, loves to play golf and ride horses. He says, I'm finished. I'm done with baseball. But Al Rosen took over here. 
And as Wilkerson takes strike three for the second down, and Smith comes up, and with Bob Lurie owning the team and giving free reign to Rosen and Craig, basically, Roger felt it was just too good an opportunity to, to pass up. And the funny thing was, he had seriously retired to the extent that in talking to Don Zimmer uh, before the game tonight, Don said he was shocked when Roger accepted and came back to the Giants in 86. Yeah. Give him a lot of credit. I'm not talking about Don Zimmer. You got him a lot of credit, too, having his team five games over 500, even though they struggled. But almost everybody said, hey, the reason they got to the World Series, talking about the Tigers in 84, is because of Roger Craig. It's grounded down to Uribe, who kicks it, but right into Thompson's glove, and he can't handle it. And Uribe winds up with the out at second base. 6-4-6 six, six is what it looks like in your scorebook. Go explain that one to your grandkids. We'll be back. Anticipation, the last inning. We'll watch Jerome Walton. First of all, this ball taking a bad hop off the arm of Uribe. It bounds over near Robbie Thompson. But look at Walton. Walton's not anticipating something going wrong, and that's what you have to do when you're running the bases. He took it for granted that the play would be made, and it didn't. But Mitchell, they still got the out. Mitchell lines one to center, and Walton shoestrings it to take a base hit away from Kevin, who hits the ball right on the money, but to no avail. One away. A 6-4-6 six, six put out yeah. at second. Let's put it this way. That's not the kind of play you work on in infield. <laughs> That's one of those situations, though, as a hitter, if, if the official scorer was going to uh, rule a base hit on that ball, you get penalized for the guy in front of you not running hard. And that's what happened to Smith. He got penalized because Walton went into second standing up and not sliding. Maldonado takes time, ball one. Jose Uribe. And there's a study in courage as you look at Uribe. You'll recall Jose was the fellow whose wife died shortly after childbirth last year, but he was able to somehow get himself back together, finish out the season with the Giants and admirably. And then he was involved in, in litigation in the Dominican over the winter and was acquitted. And then his father became seriously ill earlier this season. So it's been a, a terribly distressing 12 months for Jose, but somehow able to, to keep it together and continues to do a, a most admirable job at short. And Uribe, the lone remnant of the Jack Clark trade back in the winter mm -hmm. of 1984. Dave LaPointe, David Green, Gary Racich, and Jose Gonzalez at the time, he changed his name to Jose Uribe said there were too many Gonzaleses in the major leagues and in <laughs> baseball. And he didn't anticipate an onslaught of Uribe's. There's a drive to the deep left field. Webster goes back on the track and makes the catch for the second out. And it will bring up Litton. Earlier, in, we were talking about the courage of uh, Jose Uribe. I started to mention Dave Dravecki with the Giants. Dravecki had a malignant tumor removed from his pitching arm and there was a, a serious question as to the life or death of Dave Dravecki at the end of last baseball season but the update on the Dravecki situation he is pitching batting practice he is pitching so well in fact that the Giants are starting to talk about the possibility of Dave Dravecki pitching for the big club before this season is done and that would be as remarkable as anything I can recall in recent times. Yeah, no set plan but he threw awfully well today just throwing to the pitchers 20 minutes better than 20 minutes he threw two days ago and Norm Sherry said hey I mean we don't know what he's going to do it's just amazing he's come this far. Tumor in the deltoid major part of your shoulder. So here is a man battling cancer and battling a problem that without the cancer would be very, very difficult for, for a pitcher, obviously, to overcome. And somehow, some way, he's been able to maintain his weight. He's working out religiously. He's traveling with the team now, pitching BP. And again, Roger Craig 
saying we don't have a goal in terms of a particular date, but uh, there's a good chance he's going to wind up on the active roster. In the air to right field, and Smith gets underneath it, and Lancaster has retired seven straight. To the sixth, we go a candlestick. Giants seven, Cubs one. Candlestick Park in San Francisco. Al Michaels, Jim Palmer, Tim McCarver. Thursday night baseball. Coming from the home of the Giants. We were talking about Dave Drewecki pitching batting practice. And uh, this was taking place this afternoon at about 3.30, an hour and a half before game time. Dave throwing VP. Again, amazing. He said he's just happy to be here. Not only now, showing the club the end of spring training. Sixth inning begins with a ground ball of the bat of Grace. And Uribe throws to Clark for the out. One away, and McClendon the batter. And that, that sight of Drebecki is uh, incredible because, as we all know, it's the type of thing that none of us ever thought we'd, we'd ever see it again. Dave Drebecki in a baseball uniform. And again, with and we talked about it at the beginning of the show, Drebecki on the disabled list. Natalie Hamaker on the DL. Kelly Downs, one of their starters on the disabled list. And Mike Kruko as well. And Giants fans happy to know that Scott Gerelts will not miss a turn. It's a slight strain of the left hamstring, and he's not expected to miss a turn. That's real good news because not only is he dinged, I mentioned before Rick Russell with a slightly pulled groin had to come out of the game in Houston the other night as well. We talked about four-man rotation. A little bit harder to get well when you're pitching every fourth day. But Jeff Branley, 25-year-old youngster from Mississippi State, has done an excellent job. Only two hits in his three innings. Now three and a third innings. Three strikeouts and yet to walk somebody. In there, and 13 of his last 15 pitches have been strikes, and why not? If you've got a six-run lead, that's what you're out there to do, throw strikes. There's a lot, sometimes a lot easier to say that than do it, but he has not changed his style one bit. But the only two times he's gotten behind, they've gotten base hits. Other than that, been very aggressive, and as you said, you can do that when you have a six-run lead. Bradley looking for his first major league victory. Rounded toward the middle, Uribe ranges over to scoop it up and throw McClendon out. Jose Uribe with great range. Talked about a lower earned run average here, 186 to four point on the road. I mean, you got to hit it to get it through this infield, even though the end result is a fine play. Uribe going out towards right field, throwing back against his body. The infield really slowed that ball down or he would have gone into center field. So two down, and Webster is the batter. And Webster hits it fair down the right field line and into the corner <laughs> and into the Giants' bullpen through the, the fence. <laughs> the door was open. <laughs> that's classic. I mean, you'll be seeing this shot for, for years correct. to come. The door was open. You talk about closing the barn door after the damage was done. Where do you see this? Uh, well, it might have been Steve Bedrosian, the closer that the <laughs> Giants got from Philadelphia that did this. Check this out. Is that Bedrosian? He's saying, whoa, wait a second. <laughs> that ought to be a ground rule home run. <laughs> How do you know what's going to happen? Yeah. Lefferts, I think Craig That's Lefferts. Craig Lefferts, who was the yeah. closer before. Yeah, the left-handed closer. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's a great, that's a classic. <laughs> <laughs> Domingo Ramos hits a fly wall to center. You talk about your play of the day. <laughs> that baby's a lock. <laughs> oh, not boy. quite, but almost. Speaking of locks, <laughs> and not with bagels, <laughs> at the end of five and a half, it's the Giants seven, and the Cubs one. We'll be back after this message of news headlines from our ABC station. So back we come, bottom of the sixth inning, Candlestick Park, where the unusual always happens. <laughs> there he is. If Craig Lefferts were a fan, they would have thrown him out of the ballpark <laughs> for interfering with a ball in play. What if there were a runner on first base then? Mm. That would have been very interesting. Oh, yeah. A 
especially in a critical situation. Yeah, where an umpire has the right to determine by the way the ball was hit whether the runner at first base could have scored mm -hmm. or not. Kennedy waves a, an off-speed pitch in the count one and two. Well, that, that door is open again. Well, that's the only way he can see home plate. <laughs> right there. <laughs> Tempting fate. Ball strike three. Kennedy looks at a fastball on the outside corner. Here's another angle, and of course, this replay will be coming soon and often to ballparks near you. You'll see this on, on Diamond Vision for the next couple of years. <laughs> you got to say your line, too. Uh, Go on. This is well, great. Candy Maldonado, I said, it's like taking candy from a baby. He's lost. <laughs> or as you said, Maldonado. <laughs> Since taking a baby from Candy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Where did it go? <laughs> well, Candy known more for his bat than his glove. <laughs> the hidden ball trick. Another vein. Yeah. If we could only get the guy with the kazoo to interfere like that, we could escort him from the park. Sure. <laughs> the one to Uribe is outside ball two. two and there he is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just reach over and interfere. <laughs> Hit sharply on a hop, and Ramos stays with it and throws him out. So a fine play turned in by Ramos, who again gets the start tonight with Dunstan on the bench. And meanwhile, Lancaster uh, has settled in and has retired nine in a row. Oh, good pitch, only in the sense that it's a little bit away, but hit right on the nose. And again, that's what you do. You let him hit it and hope that your guys make good plays, and he does. And duck out of the way. And by Wilkerson, and out in the center field for a base hit for Brantley. And that's the first hit off Lancaster. All of the damage was done against Kilgis and Pico. The Giants, in fact, that's their ninth hit. The other eight came in succession in the second inning. Donnell Nixon. Want to know the count. Don't know what kind of ball player Nixon would have been had his leg not been broken back in 1985 in spring training. 18 screws put in his leg. Mm. Toward the middle, Ramos, nice play, flips the second, but Wilkerson had to come off the bag. Nixon will get an infield single. Good play by Ramos to get there, but then he had to flip it to Wilkerson, and Curtis couldn't remain at second base on the bag and thus he got it runners at first and second just another fine play the ball slowed down saw him make a nice play on the two pitches before or two batters before and just a little bit wide good play by Wilkerson being there trying to get the force one of the more tough more difficult plays you have to make as a shortstop I think some of the gracefulness in baseball often takes a place around second base the different types of throws that the shortstop and second baseman have to give each other. And that was an example of a, of a very graceful play by Ramos. And here's an example of Craig giving Thompson a chance to rest as he sends Oberfell up to pinch hit for him against the right-hander in the sixth inning. And the pitch is taken for a strike and the count on one. So Robbie Thompson, after going one for three, gets the rest of the night off. And Oberfell will take over in the seventh inning. Pinch hitting here with two on and two out. Another strike, and it's 0-2. And, Oberfell, a starter for years with St. Louis and with Atlanta, and now in a utility role with San Francisco coming over from Pittsburgh earlier in the season. Rip foul. Look out, Lefferts. <laughs> It's still 0-2. <laughs> yeah. They have the doors shut on foul ball. <laughs> right. What a gatekeeper, I guess, huh? I guess Roger Craig has the open door policy. I mean, mm -hmm. you, his door's always open, right? Yep. Well, that, that double was what you call an open and shut case, right? Yeah, of course.
here's the go-to pitch. We keep this up, they're going to bring the crane in for us. One and two the count. A reminder to our local stations, we'll take a station break for you at the end of this half inning. Two on, two out. Bottom of the sixth inning, seven to one, San Francisco. One and two on Overton. Waves doesn't get it. And the side is retired. So to the seventh inning we go. It remains seven to one, Giants. And we'll return to Candlestick Park after this word from our ABC station. They played a lot of nutty games at Candlestick Park. No exception tonight. Garelt's tripling in the second inning, but injuring his hamstring, leaving the game. The Giants, eight consecutive hits, too shy of the major league record in the second inning. Kevin Mitchell, of all people, making two of the three outs. You had a six to four to six force at second base. And of course, the, the classic scene with the the door to the bullpen being opened and closed on the ground rule double by Craig Lefferts. And we're only two-thirds of the way through. Stick around. As it's driven to left field and deep, and Mitchell goes back, and out it goes. That's the first home run for Joe Girardi, who was the opening day catcher because Barry Hill was on the disabled list, went back to the minors, and came back again from Iowa two weeks ago. His first of the season and the first of his career. What a thrill for this young man. Barry Hill opening the season, the other Cubs catcher opening the season on the disabled list. Joe Girardi doing a terrific job. And now his first major league home run and Bob Lillis is on the phone to the bullpen. And Gary Varsho comes up to hit for Lancaster. So the Cubs will have to go to their bullpen as well. The pitch is a strike and they have Calvin Chiroli throwing in their pen and there's the goose who is a middleman now and a setup man with Bedrosian the closer along with Leopard. Little comebacker to Brantley and he takes care of the pinch hitter Varsho. One down in the seventh inning. So the goose with new life. It looked like his career might be finished earlier this season. Looking for a job and the Giants took a chance. And now they're using him in a spot roll out of the pen. He's done a nice job for him. I'll tell you what I would think at the end of a career and I say that loosely because he may pitch a couple more years it wouldn't be a better guy to come play for than a guy like Roger Craig teach you that extra pitch he's been around he knows what to do and what you need to do to be successful Jerome Walton takes a strike in the count on one Giants seven Cubs two seventh inning Giants on top in the West by two coming in over Houston Cubs have lost six straight And realistically, the chances of them coming back in this game minuscule. The Cubs, after trailing after six innings or seven innings this year, are the only team in the National League not to come back and win a ball game. Of course, they're down by five runs right now. That makes it very difficult. I said the National League. It's actually the majors after trailing in the sixth inning, after the sixth inning, they're the only team in the major leagues not to have come back to win a ball game. Little chopper to third, and that's Olbergfell who pinch in and stays in the game, throwing him out. Giants moving Litton over to second from third, and Olbergfell now playing third. So two down, two out here in the seventh inning. And the batter, Curtis Wilkerson. Well, he had a release. Mike Kruko, who's been on the DL since June 5th, will have arthroscopic surgery for his inflamed shoulder. Probably about a 20-game winner back in 1986. And we'll have that tomorrow morning. It's rolled down to Clark. And that's that for the Cubs in the seventh. They get the run on the home run by Girardi. And at the end of six and a half, it's the Giants seven, Cubs two. Balmy night, all things considered, at Candlestick Park. In the twilight, the Giants with a seven-run explosion in the second inning, leading the Cubs seven to two. 
And we go to the bottom of the seventh inning, and Calvin Schiraldi takes over. The fourth Chicago pitcher. And he'll go to work on Clark, Mitchell, and Maldonado. Will Clark, one for three, hits it in the air to shallow left center field. That's Webster getting underneath it. And Clark is gone on the first pitch. Kevin Mitchell has nicknamed Will Clark the cape, and it's because of its swing. It looks like that he's throwing a cape around his face with his left arm. There's such extension with that swing. And a good chance to see it. Boy, you talk about extension on his swing. This is why he's nicknamed the cape. Watch the extension on the left arm. I mean, you've heard the term classic swing. That's that's oh, it. Boy. It doesn't it doesn't look any prettier than that. Mitchell takes up high ball one. One and zero. Oh. Cape of good hope for the Giants, I guess, huh? I mean, in, in years to come, I'm sure cartoonists and others who draw will, will probably use a photo of Clark's swing to denote a baseball player. Two and one, which, which, you know, you see these, you see generic commercials for baseball with a pitcher throwing, and it's Palmer. <laughs> I'm not to it flatter is. you, but yeah. you've seen your, yourself uh, caricatured in generic ads. You can recognize that distinct wind-up motion. Didn't know that delivery hurt my back. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the classic delivery. Houston leading Montreal, 5-1. to one. Billy Hatcher has hit a three-run homer, and the Braves have already beaten the Reds. You know, with, the count. with your delivery, Jim, I could see how you would have back problems. because you I mean, I really didn't, didn't have them jokingly say that. You didn't, but you, you didn't use you, your legs like a guy like Seaver. Or even, or even good. But, the, you know, uh -huh. the classic guys that I've seen... Uh, the guy that pitched a long time, the guy that comes to mind is Nolan Ryan. Here's a guy that's pitched well over 4,000 innings. And even Bly Levin, who is about to write around 4,500 innings, 38 years old, has such flexibility and uses his legs a little bit more. Mitchell draws the walk, so Kevin goes to first base with one out of the seventh inning. And Candy Maldonado comes to the And, of course, Clark, again, you know, he says, hey, the reason I'm getting a lot of pitches to hit, I'm using left field, but also Kevin Mitchell's hitting me behind me. I don't want to pitch around me to get to Kevin. Not the year he's having, the 25 home runs, 70 RBIs. And if this guy gets hot, then they're not going to pitch around Mitchell, even though if, if you've got a choice, who are you going to pitch to? Kevin Mitchell with 25 home runs or Cadney Maldonado? Strike in the count on one. And the other counterpart, Ernest Riles, who's hitting very well for an average, but not much of a home run hitter. Shortstop that plays third base plays very well defensively for the Giants. Interesting how important the legs are when a pitcher throws or when a hitter hits. You have to use the lower part of your body. You know, it's interesting you say that. Talking to Dusty Baker, I said, well, what's the difference between Maldonado, as you said, three years ago when he had a great year? He said he's barrel-chested. He doesn't use his legs. Just uses his upper body and spins out. Pulls off the ball. Left shoulder is so important. See that left shoulder spin? He said he does not have good balance at home plate. I wonder then, with most of the athletes in this country trained using their hands athletically, and you have to use the lower part of your body. There's Dusty Baker. I wonder if in European countries or South American countries, if you have to use the upper part of your body to facilitate the lower part of your body. I would say yes. Mm -hmm. That in soccer, for instance, mm -hmm. the most popular sport in the world, that you would have to use the upper part of your body to facilitate and to help the lower part of your body. In baseball, you do it differently. Throwing and hitting, you've got to use the lower parts of your body. Did Pele win any gold gloves? I'm not sure. <laughs> he, won. <laughs> he, won a, he won a lot of things in Brazil with these types of movements. <laughs> but he wasn't swinging a baseball bat. <laughs> and then again, does it have something to do with being south of the equator? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean, though. Oh, I sure. Mean, follow. Good point. 2-2 pitch is wrapped 
into left center field off the glove of Ramos for a base hit. And Mitchell pulls in his second. So Candy has his second hit. He is two for four. The Giants have 11 hits. And it will bring up Lit. Just off the glove of Domingo Ramos. Cal Ripken would have had it at 6'5. Domingo a lot shorter. Of course, the only reason I say that is because the height difference. Candlestick Park, Thursday night baseball. The Giants, the Chicago Cubs. Cubs after. I guess escaping what used to be the friendly confines of Wrigley Field, losing all six games on a homestand, coming in here trying to snap that streak. But the Giants erupted for seven runs in the second and lead seven to two and look for more in the bottom of the seventh inning. I guess to amplify your point, I, we talked last week about Ripken, soccer player, so he had the hand and eyes from baseball, and he had the control of his lower body from playing another sport that most kids don't play in this country. Got to have fast feet to play shortstop or any infield position. Foul territory. Girardi comes all the way back to the screen but runs out of room. And the count is one and one. I'm surprised after Joe's first home run that the screen stopped him. <laughs> <laughs> the old Gary Carter about three rows back. Johnny Bent, some of those outstanding plays. Not to say that he could have had this ball. One ball, one strike to count. Calvin Schiroldi. Missing away. Two and one. Seven runs, 11 hits, and one error for the Giants. Two runs, seven hits, and no errors for the Cubs. Three and one. Calvin getting some innings, and one of the reasons the Cubs have had a pretty good bullpen this year. Mitch Williams with 18, with Don Lim, Zimmer looks on. Giraldi with four saves. Last year a starter, this year used in the bullpen. Three and two, the count. Of Cubs bullpen certainly has been affected, but they have a very strange bullpen. They have a bullpen that consists of pitchers that throw mostly fly balls with the exception of Jeff Pico. Usually you think of a bullpen who can come in a short man who can come in and get you a double play. The three main guys Steve Wilson Mitch Williams and Calvin Schiraldi have given up only six ground ball double plays all year long and that's not a lot for guys who usually come in with men on base. Runners go, and it's hit to right field and over the head of Smith for extra bases. And around third and coming home is Maldonado, and the Giants now lead it 9-2 on a two-run double. So Roger Craig, and he can afford to do it, a five-run lead. Puts Mitchell and Maldonado in motion, and Litton delivers with a double to make it 9-2 to two San Francisco. Easy scattering port. They've thrown him up out over the plate twice. He tripled and then doubled. With Tony Gwynn's bat. <laughs> what a do the count. Now, who was telling us the story? He said Will he, Clark. Yeah, yeah, Will Clark was saying that uh, Litton picked him, made a couple of great plays, and then... When he got down to down down to talking to Tony, he says, "Can I have a couple of your bats?" He said, "Wait a minute, you know, let those you, balls go by. You, you can't know, make defensive plays yeah. like that against me, and then yeah. expect me to give you one of my bats." But Tony did. Two and zero the count. Litton's only home run against San Diego, June 11th, was a ninth inning home run, and that prevented Rick Russell from losing the game, thereby keeping his winning streak in order. Russell has won nine in a row for the Giants. And 12 overall. As Kennedy pops it up. Wilkerson having trouble, but here comes Smith, and Smith takes care of it for the out. 
So two away. And Jose Uribe is due up with Litton at second base. And looks like Ernest Riles. The Giants going to the bench. It'll be Riles who comes up to hit for him. So Ernest Riles, he came over last year in the deal in Milwaukee that sent Jeffrey Leonard to the Brewers. And at the moment, Riles is being platooned with Litton at third base. Ernest Riles. And I guess what the Giants are hoping, and we talked about the fact that they want to see Matt Williams eventually come up and take over as the everyday third baseman and the number five hitter, and then Riles would be more of a super sub than anything else. Along with Greg Litton, mm -hmm. the way he's been hitting. Well, the one thing Riles can do, oh, excuse me, Timmy, is that he can play shortstop. Very important part of a utility type of guy. And he came up as a shortstop with Milwaukee. Great years in the minors. We're talking 340, 350. Line drive hit a classic stroke. Wait, ooh, ooh, can't see it there. Girardi stepping in front of Riles. And actually, you come off the bench. First base is open, and it's 9 to 2. And the other team has lost six in a row. And here comes Roger Craig. Well, Riles with the appropriate name right now because yeah. that's exactly what he is. You know how hard it is to throw a ball that far inside from a right-hander to a left-hander? I mean, you really got to open up, and maybe the reason Chiraldi's has given up runs is, be is because he has bad mechanics. But to get the ball that far inside, normally your ball would run away from a left-handed yeah, hitter. Look right. at this ball. I mean, that ball is, what, two feet inside? So you never know what may have happened between Riles and Chiraldi when Chiraldi was with the Red Sox and Riles was with the Brewers. And meanwhile, both managers were just warned by the crew chief, Harry Wendelstead. And it may have shocked both managers as much as it has everybody else. This might be just a personal battle between Chiraldi and Riles for some reason. And it might be accidental, but it appears to be something more than accidental. It appears to be. It might not be, but it appears to be. How about personal battles? Mark Grace and Frank Capino got Grace on the disabled list because he charged them out. Yeah. Dislocated his shoulder and hurt the Cubs. Here's a guy that's hitting over 316. But you're right. You don't know what's going on, but I tell you what, that looked, if anything looked that intentional, it's tough to get the ball that far inside. Unless it's a breaking ball, and that was not a breaking ball. Pat Sheridan now comes up to hit for Brantley. So Brantley does a great job in relief stands to pick up his first major league victory unless the Giants blow a huge lead they're up by seven nine to two and here is Sheridan one to know Sheridan coming over from Detroit in the deal that sent Tracy Jones to the Tigers so they picked up Bedrosian from Philadelphia on the 18th two days prior to that Sheridan who right now is platooning with Candy Maldonado in right field and Sheridan is one of those guys, as Chiraldi misses high ball, too, who seems to have a rabbit's foot in his pocket because in his relatively brief Major League career, he's wound up in postseason play three times, including a member of the Kansas City Royals winning the World Championship in 1985. 3-0 the count. Well, good outfielder, too. So you're talking about a tough outfield here on normal days, a lot of artificial turf in the National League. Pat can play the outfield. Came up with the Royals. That's the most spacious park in the American League. Traditionally, good first halves, bad second halves. Hasn't played that much this year. And Sheridan walks on four pitches. And that'll load him up for Donnell Nixon. I wouldn't look for any retaliation by the Giants. I don't think they want to wake the Cubs up. Number one, the Cubs on their road to losing their seventh in a row. And number two, I think the umpires have warned both benches if, in their opinion, anybody else throws at anybody, the manager and the pitcher automatically ejected. And they were warned. Right. That, by the way, is the first batter that Chiroldi has hit this season. So he's going through a streak of wildness here. With the bases loaded, the pitch connection is a strike, and the count is on one.
one and one. Squibber foul. One ball, two strikes on Nixon. Litton is the runner at third. Riles away to his lead at second. And Sheridan at first. One ball, two strikes with two outs. Bottom of the seventh inning. 9 2 San Francisco. Two pitch is fouled back. Nixon, the eighth man to hit in the inning. The Giants in the second inning sent 11 men to the plate. Scored seven times to break it wide open. Brantley, meanwhile, out of the bullpen to work five innings, allowed just one run on the home run by Girardi. Again, the one two pitch is a breaking ball. Pop foul back behind the Giants' dugout. And still one and two. E fan. Tim, you can either agree or disagree. What do you think, Calvin Chiraldi? Good stuff. Occasional bad location. Good fastball. Can't get his breaking ball over. Yeah. <laughs> Seems to me that Chiraldi, when he does throw strikes, he's throws balls in the fat part of the plate. Curve away, two and two. I think the best way to get hitters out is moving the ball from one side of the plate to the other, not up and down. Yet you still hear baseball people talk about how you've got to keep the ball down. That does not guarantee that you're going to get the hitter out. Moving it inside and outside, that's something Chiraldi doesn't do well, and that's an example right there. And now he's full, and that means the runners will be going. Litton from third, Riles from second. Sheridan from first. And it also means he'll throw in the middle of the plate a little bit more. And he walks in a run. So in the inning, he's walked three, hit a man, given up two hits, thrown almost 40 pitches, and the Giants lead 10 to 2. Again, concentration so much an important part of hitting, pitching, doing anything, and you come in in a ball game that's already seven to two, and you don't have your concentration, and this is the result. Don't make good pitches, you don't get the ball over. The other team, of course, is having fun. That's why they have 10 runs on the board. And your ERA can be ruined for just about the entire year with a job like this, especially if you're a short man. Strike to Oberfell in the count of 1 1. Outfield playing real shallow. Hits one up to Gap. Talking six runs. Three more already with a three already scored. That's a lot of runs in one inning. He lays off in the count 1 and 1 on Oberfell. Yeah, that is the plight of the short reliever. You could have. 10 scoreless outings in a row and maybe pitch seven innings and then you get lit up once and the ERA explodes. Line to left field and that's a base hit. It will score Riles. It will score Sheridan. And the Giants have five in the inning to lead it 12 to two. There's nobody in the Cubs bullpen. They said control problems. Overfell a line drive hitter. Struck out earlier on a good change at that time. He just goes with it. Falls in front of Webster. Two more runs. And 
Bork drills it to deep right field, but it sinks, and Smith goes back to make the catch. Maybe the hardest hit ball in the inning. Simply a long out. Ten men come to the plate. So the Giants send 11 men to the plate in the second, 10 more in the seventh, 12 to San Francisco. Thursday night baseball, the Giants leading at 12 to 2, and Goose Gossage comes out of the bullpen to try to wrap it up for Jeff Brantley, who would be his first major league victory. And the first pitch is taken outside by Smith, will be followed by Grace and McClendon. Next week will be, most of you will see the game between the Reds and the Mets. Others will see Kansas City against Oakland. And that'll be a big day as well for Pete Rose. It's the next time they go back into the courtroom of Norbert Nadel. And if you're wondering about any news in that situation today in regard to Rose, there was some news that came from Cincinnati as the pitch misses inside. And that was a judge who ruled in favor of Rose, and that was Judge Nadel in his lawsuit against baseball has accepted more than sixteen hundred dollars in past campaign contributions from lawyers in the two firms that represent rose and also according to the philadelphia inquirer report today contributions totaling 150 dollars received by natal from the cincinnati law firm representing major league baseball as well and in checking this out they tell us experts in the field that this is a relatively common practice so this was basically the only news to come out of that situation today Smith at first base after drawing the walk and grace the batter and the count to an O. saw Bob Lillis there just telling his infielders to play for one out play Will Clark for one out and you see Will Clark especially not only not holding Smith on, but playing as though there were no runners on. And Gossage behind now, three of them. Eight pitches, only one for a strike. And what's amazing to lead off that or a 2-1 slider. Goose walks have been his problem. He finally throws the strike. 15 walks in 27 innings. His record is quite good at 2-1. And, and as you said, Al, not used as a stopper, a guy that is either a setup man or somebody to pitch in this type of situation. Pop foul back of third. Obergefell coming all the way over and reaches up. And does he make the catch? Yes, he does. Harry Wendelstadt was there. And it appeared as if a fan may have touched it. Not only did he touch it, I think he caught it. Yeah. But he, in doing so, reached onto the field. Right. That's an automatic out with the umpire there to see it as he is. And Wendell Stack makes a nice play, but a nice call. Yeah, he sure. Deems, he it deems is. it's over into playing field, and you get the out. Good call. Yep. Good catch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Usually they escort him out of the ballpark, unfortunately. If they do, we're going to hear a boo. But Lendon takes a strike, and the count 0-1. Major League rules saying you cannot lead onto the playing field to interfere with the ball. One and one the count. I think the interesting thing is you look at Goose Gossage, has he lost a lot of velocity? They said last year when he had 13 saves that he was trying to throw so too hard. And when you do that, you don't get movement on the ball. He said, sure, I throw over 90. Well, I don't think he does that. They've tried to slow his motion down, have him have a looser arm, a little bit looser grip, a little bit more movement. You can get people out in the middle 80s. Can't get them out if you don't throw the ball over the plate, though. I tell you, he got a lot of guys out from the middle 70s to the uh -huh. middle 80s, didn't he? You no, know, but he's struggling in the late Active eight. and fearsome. Yeah. That's out of play in the count. Three balls and two strikes. He used to knock guys down when they took good swings. Again, freewheeling, just lets it go. All arms, all legs. Not what I'd call a finesse pitcher. Fastball slider. As we said, he's been working a little bit on the split finger. Nothing tricky about Goose Gossage. Out of play. 
Well, what would you call it if, if Mitch Williams were in closing it to the Cubs and Goose Gossage to the Giants? Sort of a, a neoclassic matchup. Now, what Zimmer wants Williams to do is what Gossage learned to do later in his career, which is throw occasional slider. Zimmer said Williams, even though he has 18 saves, he's too predictable. Fastball, fastball, fastball. But they may be the two most classic cases as you look at Brett Butler of guys just rearing back and firing. Well, again, intimidation, deception, and then good velocity and movement, and occasionally great location. Easy play for Nixon. Two down. And when I think of Gossage, I think of the 98 mile per hour fastball that when we did the playoffs, I believe in 70, what, 80? In 80. 80. Yankees, that, Kansas City. Yes. That, that, that Brett hit in the third deck of Yankee Stadium clocked at 98 miles per hour out over the plate. Pitch that normally did not get hit off of Goose. Webster, and that was the coup de grace in terms of uh, that series as the Royals swept the Yankees in three and went on to beat Philadelphia in the World Series. One and one. One and two to count. Two out, one ball, two strikes to count. Smith at first base. And called strike three to end the top of the eighth inning. Shaky start, strong finish, and a serenade of goose. 12 2 San Francisco. Back at Candlestick Park in San Francisco. Going to the bottom of the eighth inning. And Bill Bate will lead things off facing Calvin Chiraldi and takes a strike. So Bate hitting here for Mitchell. It's an honor in the bottom of the eighth in a 12 to 2 game. Well, one of the ironies tonight, you're right. I mean, how often are you going to hit for Mitchell? <laughs> the irony tonight is the fact that here are the Giants leading 12 to 2, so around the country. People are thinking that McClark and Mitchell must have each had a fabulous night. They were a combined one for eight. So Bays hitting for Mitchell in the bottom of the eighth inning. And they like his bat. Their third catcher who apparently hit by a foul ball and dislocated his shoulder or was Broke separated. His shoulder. Yeah, yeah, two years ago. Quick bat. Good numbers. DH possibility if he was in the American League. Outside. Two balls and two strikes. In reality, Bade was catching in the in the top of the inning, so Mitchell had come out of the game. It's not that he is pinch hitting, he is hitting in Mitchell's spot in the bottom of the eighth. And he swings at a breaking ball and doesn't get it. And becomes the first out in the bottom of the eighth. Now if the U US senior open, Al Guyberger, the leader, four under. Boydston, the amateur, three under. Hill, Beard, Nichols, and Dill, two under at the end of one round. And our coverage, of course, of the U.S. Senior Open on ABC comes your way this weekend. Saturday, 2.30 Eastern and Pacific and 1.30 Central Time. Candy Maldonado. Takes high ball one. Clark and Mitchell one for eight and not only that the Giants was seven in the second five in the seventh in those two innings Kevin Mitchell was 0 for two in the in the second inning Clark was 0 for two in the seventh inning those two the two hot guys they're one and two punch they're dynamic duo as you see Mitch <laughs> that went through his swing right. right of course Clark hit a couple balls right on the nose that's big news though he's one for five The Giants with a total of 13 hits tonight.
2-1 from Chiroli, missing away, ball three. Three and one the count. Yeah, that's the interesting thing about losing streak. You come out to the ballpark, you've left Wrigley Field where you lost six in a row. You have a good attitude, as they did. You get a run in the first inning, and then all of a sudden, one of your strengths, which is your pitching, falls apart. Well, even in that losing streak, they've been getting good pitching. Mm -hmm. So tonight, where you have a totally positive attitude, you think everything's going to turn around because you played well on the road. To look at the scoreboard in the eighth inning, and it's you're down by 10 runs. Yeah, the Cubs entered the game seven over 500 on the road, three under at home at Wrigley, and that's unlike Cub history. They've usually played well at home and poorly on the road. Litton at the plate. Strange as it may seem, and you guys have been through enough losing streaks in your careers. Sometimes you need you need a game like this. You lose tight, close games, and then you get blown out, and you say to yourself, it, well, it can't get any worse. Right. Okay. New life tomorrow. I guarantee you those five guys we didn't see tonight, three or four, or maybe five, will be in the lineup tomorrow. No reflection on this lineup, but Andre Dawson, a couple weeks off the disabled list. Apparently still has some soreness in that right knee. Line to center, but right to Walton. I mean, even the outs tonight are loud. Two gone. Well, baseball is a game where you have to appraise, and as you see, Randy McCammon, who will be the pitcher in the ninth inning probably, but you have to keep appraising and reappraising your situation, both individually and as a team. Managers, that's one of their responsibilities, to continue to remind their team of that. Montreal's losing the night five to one. The Cubs enter the game two and a half out. And regardless of how you're going, if you stop the bleeding in time, then you forget about losing seven in a row. Mm -hmm. And you pick up two and a half games behind Montreal. And you can make it eight to one now, Houston. Yeah, Zimmer musing a couple of weeks ago that he was going to have a meeting to tell how how well his tell his team how well they were playing. He said, that's silly. You another ball way inside. Brett Butler hitting here, batting for Gossage, who was in the number seven spot. There's Vance Law amongst those not in the lineup tonight, standing. He said, normally you just have a meeting when you're losing. You don't have one to tell him how great they're playing. He was thrilled. Butler hitting for Gossage, and you saw Randy McCammon come into the dugout, so he'll come in, and there's Sandberg. And his pose very much reflecting the state of the Cubs at the moment. And also himself, two, and two for 40. Players watch managers too, and the manager's reactions when a team is going poorly is very, very important. It's easy when you're winning, and Don Zimmer certainly knows that. The easiest thing in the world when things are going well to be smiling, calling everybody by their first name. But it's the toughest thing in the world to be the same manager when things are going poorly. Then you have more of a tendency to call players by their last names. <laughs> or or some other names uh, yes, that we right. can't mention. <laughs> Three and two. So full count two down. Maldonado will be taking off from first. Hitting for Gossage here in the bottom of the eighth inning. Should be duly noted as you look at Candy and Maldonado. Brett Butler, one of the reasons that the top four hitters for the Giants. I mean, they select four. 297. Butler, Thompson, Clark, and Mitchell. Three and two the count. So Maldonado back to first. Two out. Bottom of the eighth inning. 12 to two Giants. Yeah, he said, I've scored 43 runs, and I'm way behind Robbie Thompson, Will Clark, and Kevin Mitchell. Hard to believe that's happened, but it's, it talks about how great their offense has been, at least the first four. Back out of play, and it's still three and two. Thompson, Clark, and Mitchell, the top three in runs scored in the National League. Reminds me of Oakland. You talked about a crowd in your opening across the bay. You know, Jackson and uh, Bando and Rudy and Darren Johnson and tennis. They could beat you, but North and Campanera set the table. I mean, you had to pitch those other guys. And Butler takes ball four. So Chiraldi in an inning and two-thirds has walked five, hit a man, 
has given up five runs and Riles comes to the plate and this is this is a case where you just become a sacrificial lamb there's been nobody up in the bullpen there wasn't anybody up in the seventh inning you're already four deep in terms of pitching the game is out of hand it's you pal period and as Jim mentioned this can just wreak incredible havoc on the earned run average speaking of the A's and a Cross the World Series. There's one proponent of such an eventuality. Two and zero. Oh. I mean, let's really look at and assess Calvin Chiraldi. What he's not the number one stopper now. They have Mitch Williams. What does he have to really look back at? His stats. So one inning like this could be disastrous. Emotionally, not to mention statistically. Three and zero the count. You know when you think about it, Jim, you were fortunate in your career never to have to go through what Calvin Chiraldi's going through right only, now. Only, only a year, my first year, and I was just happy to mop up. Yeah, right. I mean, I'd clean the clubhouse. And anything they wanted me to do, well, you know, you your sure rookie have year. Sure, changed. <laughs> <don't> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that I have. <laughs> it's a matter of conditioning, but when you're a rookie, you'll do anything. Not that Calvin Chiraldi's a rookie, but this is what he's got to do. It's a team game. But this is mechanics. You talk about your front shoulder and hitting, your front shoulder and pitching is just as important. And I'm sure he's real frustrated. As we said, great stuff, just unable to control it tonight. Well, you talk about a horrible looking line in the box score the next day. Woo! He's worked an inning and two thirds. He's given up five runs. And the Giants have the bases loaded. He's yielded three hits. He's walked six. Struck out one. Hit a man. Look at that left shoulder. He is trying to keep it in. He's unable to do it. Pat Sheridan takes high ball one. You have a feeling like when your front shoulder flies, it's you're going off towards the left. Home plate is to the right. And all the ball has a tendency to do is just run away because you've opened up too quickly. One and one. Yeah, everything's wild in the same spot. Up and away to left-handers. And up and in to right-handers. Even when he catches the corner, it's on the outside part of the plate. And that's the example of what you were talking about, that front side opening up too quickly. There he misses away. Well, and then, and then also when you block six guys, the strike zone is very small. You know, haven't been consistent. You're not uh, throwing the ball where the catcher's glove is. If you walk six and inning two-thirds inning, you're going to have to throw the ball pretty much in the middle of the plate, almost have the hitter swing to get a strike. Hey, that pitching line will elicit a holy cow from Harry Carey. <laughs> the other sort. The really unfortunate thing is it comes after six straight losses in a game they probably weren't going to win anyway and something that just necessity dictates that Calvin has to do. Still two and two on Sheridan. And what he's saying is, can't they just pop one of these pitches up? Why do they have to foul them all back? Can't they just hit one at somebody? And I don't mean in one hop to one of my outfielders. That's ground into the right side. Grace comes up with it, flips to Chiraldi on a close play just in time. So the Giants strand three. We'll go to the ninth. It's the Giants 12 and the Cubs two. Francisco, Giants have been going all night long. They lead 12 to two. They're on top by two games in the Western Division and figure to remain two games in front of Houston with the Astros out in front of Montreal at Olympic Stadium tonight. Reds have already lost. And here is Randy McCammon, who made his major league debut yesterday afternoon at the Astrodome in Houston. Worked two scoreless innings. Said after the game he was very, very nervous and was glad to get that out of the way. And I'm sure he is not quite as nervous tonight. Yeah, face Glenn Davis. Struck him out on three pitches. Faces Ramos here starting the ninth inning, and he fouls it back. Started the season at Shreveport, where he's 4-2, then moved up to their AAA ball club in Phoenix, 
he was 2 and up. So 6 and 2 totally. And what's it all about? Big league ball. He's here. A workhorse. That's grounded to third. Scooped up by Overfell. And Ramos is out number one. And Joe Girardi will come to the plate. One reason the Giants brought the Cam Duff the other day was the fact they had been going with nine pitchers. With all of the guys on the disabled list, and then Russell with the groin strain, they sent Ed Urak down and brought McCammon in to go to a 10-man staff. And, of course, more changes to come as soon as some of these people start coming off the DL. Which is good news for the Giants and bad news for the rest of the division. Oh, McCammon I talked about Downs get healthy. Mike Kruko, who will have arthroscopic surgery tomorrow, we wish him well. Dr. Joe will do it in Centinella Hospital down, in, or down by L.A. To right center field and deep, but Nixon goes back to make the catch. So Girardi, who had his first major league homer in the seventh inning, flies out to deep center here in the ninth, two down. And Damon Berryhill will come up as the Giants are out away from putting it away. Nothing like speed, Tim. We were talking earlier, didn't he have 144 steals one year? Back in 83, the same year that Vince Coleman had 145. Do you know you don't get something for nothing, and the Giants bring it up Randy McCammon. They traded Dennis Cook and Terry Mulholland to the Philadelphia Phillies when Steve Bedrosian came to the Giants. Dennis Cook, in particular, a fine, fine young pitcher has won his first two starts for Philadelphia. So that depleted their young pitchers a bit. In the air to deep left field, Sheridan fades and makes the catch to end it. So a perfect inning with some help from his friends for McCammon. All Don Zimmer can do is forget it, get a good night's sleep, and see what tomorrow brings. But today, brings a continuation of a losing streak that goes to seven and for Roger Craig a victory that keeps the Giants two games in front in the National League Western Division so Brantley wins it it's his first major league victory killed the loser there it is up to the minute and again that doesn't factor in uh, Houston tonight Houston is leading Montreal eight to one in the seventh inning, so Houston would be two back. Reds have already lost five and a half back in San Diego and L.A. Meeting shortly. There are the final totals. Robbie Thompson hits his ninth home run for the Giants. Joe Girardi hits a home run for Chicago. The Giants with seven runs in the second. Five more in the seventh and route the Cubs. And San Francisco is now 27 and 12 here at Candlestick Park. That's the best home record in the majors. Up to the minute standings of the National League East where Montreal leads the Mets by two and a half but with Montreal losing the Mets off tonight they would be two games back. Cubs third and the Cardinals are fourth and we'll be back to wrap it up from Candlestick in just a moment. There are the numbers again as the Giants win it. They come home from a road trip where they won four of six in San Diego and Houston and the uh, the first of a four-game series against the Chicago Cubs will be their final home outings prior to the All-Star break. Giants route the Cubs 12-2, and we'll return in a moment. Final score 12-2 San Francisco, and we can tell you the executive producer of ABC Sports is Jeffrey Mason. The coordinating producer of ABC's Thursday Night Baseball is Kurt Gowdy Jr., who also produced tonight's game, which was directed by Craig Janoff, our technical director, Mike Blazo, associate director, David Kiviat. Assistance to the producer, Joe Castellano and Rick Abbott. And our director of information, Steve Hurd. Saturday on ABC Sports, some of the greatest legends in golf meet as we begin our weekend coverage of the 1989 U.S. Senior Open. Been on ABC's Wide World of Sports, two events combining speed and European flavor. You'll see live track and field action from Oslo, Norway, featuring six-time Olympic gold medalist Carl Lewis and Great Britain Steve Cram. Plus, cycling's greatest event gets underway as we begin our coverage of the Tour de France. And next week on ABC's Thursday Night Baseball, the Cincinnati Reds roll into New York to face the Mets. Or Kansas City takes on the Oakland A's. Now stay tuned for Nightline following your late local news.
ABC's Thursday Night Baseball. Brought to you by the heartbeat of America. Today's Chevrolet. By Miller Lite, sole sponsor of the match of the century, Lightomania. And by IBM. Whatever your size, whatever your needs, IBM is working to bring you the best solution. This has been a presentation of ABC Sports, recognized around the world as the leader in sports television.